Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. There's some kind of trick to knowing the order of those books. Uh, somebody says General Electric Power Company. Yeah. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. No, Philippians. Philippian Power Company. Philippians, Colossians. Yeah. So uh, Galatians chapter 4. We'll, st we'll start in verse uh, 28, and we're going to go through Galatians 5.13. It says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he was he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So here you have... A picture you had Abraham who God promised him that his seed would become a great nation and him and Sarah got uh, impatient and uh, she said going to Hagar my maiden because maybe God will bless your seed through Hagar my maiden and so Hagar had this had a son named Ishmael who's the father of the Arab nations and of Islam and all that good stuff but that was the bond woman and this is a picture of Jews under the law and Christians under grace. The birth of Isaac was the free woman which was promised to Abraham. Uh, Ishmael was not conceived out of promise. He was conceived out of man's impatience for God. You know, God's never in a hurry about anything. He's not. And so, you know, some of the great preachers say when you get saved, the hardest thing that's going to be in your life is to know what's coming from God and what's coming from the devil. And, and I can tell you that in my life's experience and my learning that God's never in a hurry about anything, usually if whatever decision or path is in front of you that has pressure behind it, it has to be done right now, it's probably not of God. Because God doesn't get in a hurry. And so... Uh, here you have this example given to us in scripture between the bondwoman and the free woman. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore. And the reason why we went through that little portion is because when you see a therefore in the Bible, you've got to say wherefore, therefore. So you've you, you got to back up to get the context. So because of the bondwoman and the free woman, uh, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty whereby, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren... If I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, I pray for this message today. Lord, it's probably one of the most important messages that a Christian can receive. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would do the teaching, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would help us to take any scales away from our eyes, any hindrance, any cares of the world that would make our minds to wander, Lord, and let us focus on your word today, Lord, because this is a message of utmost importance. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd be the guide and the director, that you put a watchman at my mouth, that I'd say things that are pleasing to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Clearly, the, the uh, Bible teaches that we have liberty. 
as a Christian. And here in the passage that we just read, Paul is saying, listen, if you're going to lean on the law, then you're going to be answerable to the whole law. So you don't get saved from the law. In, later on in the Bible, it says that the law was our schoolmaster. Some people have this idea that God put man on this earth, then he came up with a set of rules and regulations that he knew man couldn't live by and threw them down here, but that's not how it worked at all. Man couldn't see his fallen condition. Man was already fallen. Man didn't fall because God sent down a law. Man fell when they took of the fruit of the gar of the, in the garden of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's when man fell. And everybody born after that time is in a fallen condition. So God didn't set down his law so that man could fall. That wasn't God's goal. God sent down the law so that man could see their fallen condition. They were already fallen, but they couldn't see it. Because there, you'll see passages in the Bible and it should um, spark your interest when you see stuff like, and, and uh, men did what was right in their own eyes. You know, usually if it's right in your eyes, it doesn't mean that it's right at all. You know, being right in your own eyes doesn't mean it's right. It, mean, it means it's right to you, but it doesn't mean it's right before an almighty, holy um, God. And so, the law was sent down here so that man could, God, God would say, you're filthy, and you don't even see it. Let me send down this law so you can see how filthy you are. So the law was sent down for a schoolmaster. And nobody could live up to the law because you're in a fallen condition. But when you get saved, you have liberty in Christ. You're no longer under the law. You're no longer a debtor to the law. And, and that is a praise God thing. But you know what? Some Christians use that inappropriately. Well, if I'm not under the law, I can do whatever I want to do. Well, they're still sowing and reaping. There, there's still uh, consequences for decisions and actions that you take. And so I felt that this message was really prudent because you've heard me say, and I'm quoting uh, uh, Dr. Ruckman when I say it, you know, I'm not going to come up with a list of rules and regulations for y'all. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. And if you can't quit it, beat yourself up. Amen? Amen? But some people can get the wrong direction out of that kind of a message from a preacher. I don't know how. If it's right, do it. You know, it's, it's a sin to know what's right and not to do it. Yeah. The Bible says, He that knoweth to do a good thing and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's a sin to know something that's right to do and you don't do it. If it's wrong, quit it. Well, preacher, give us a list of what's wrong. Listen, the Holy Spirit has to teach you what's wrong. I can't teach you what's wrong. And this might come as a shock to you. Something that may be wrong to you may not be wrong to me. And we have that example in the Bible where Paul's talking about eating meats that were offered to idols. Paul says that idol's nothing. And if you can get Zeus burger at $1.50 a pound, <laughs> What's a good price on hamburger? I don't know. Dollar twenty cents is a good price. If you can get Zeus Burger for a dollar a pound, where the regular hamburger costs a dollar twenty-eight or whatever, and it doesn't bother your conscience, do it. But if it does bother your conscience, don't do it. And the person that doesn't have a that has a strong conscience that can do it needs to be careful that he doesn't offend somebody with a weak conscience that can't do it amen, amen. so you have this example in scripture you have this example in scripture you know uh, Jack Hiles and you know there were a lot of things that were wrong with Jack Hiles but that guy could preach and I don't know if you ever heard any of his preaching but Jack Hiles could preach and uh, he preached a message once entitled, You Have No Right to All Your Rights. And he preached this message at a time when everybody was demanding that, and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. You know, uh, and I'm not going to say what's right or what's wrong, but that, and I don't know celebrities' names, so just forgive me, but that gal on the NBC News that got fired this week because 
she said she didn't see anything wrong with dressing up in blackface for a Halloween costume. And they fired her over that. And I told Lisa, now, now listen, I'm not into Halloween, but I told Lisa, so are they going to, is it wrong then to dress up as a ninja? Because that's an ethnic thing. Is it, is it wrong to dress up as an Indian? <laughs> so so the, the whole country has gotten so super sensitive over such silly things. And they were saying when they fired her, they were saying, this hurt everybody, this comment hurt everybody in America. I said, no, it didn't. No. Certainly didn't hurt me none. And uh, I don't see how it would even hurt an African American because how does that impact you? Well, and she said a white person with a black face or a black person with a white face. She said it both ways. She did. So that really got me. But you want to know what? We, we don't want to. We don't want to get off. We don't want to get off on that bunny trail. But the point is this: it's, it's just we're too sensitive. And she's crying all the way to the banks. I think she's still getting like six or eight million bucks for her contract. Sixteen million bucks. So they really hurt her. But Jack Hiles preached this message, you have no right to all your rights. It was a good message. It was a good message. And uh, I'm not going to repeat the message, but I just want you to hear the title. You have no right to all your rights. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful unto me. Paul's again talking about the liberty in Christ. All things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. With liberty comes responsibility. You can't just go off haphazardly because you have liberty. And you say, okay, I can do whatever I want to do. The Holy Spirit gives you a conscience and he convicts you of some of the things that you do. And some of you gloss over that conscience. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So, <clears throat> all things are not expedient. So what does expedient mean? It means literally hastening, urging forward. Hence, tending to promote the object proposed. Fit for Suit, fit or suitable for the purpose, proper under the circumstances. Uh, many things may be lawful which are not expeditious. So, uh, getting that from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you know when he says many things are lawful that are not expeditious, he's getting that right from this verse. There's some things that you can do that aren't prudent to the environment. They're, they're uh, they're not uh, proper under the circumstances. For example, it's a home church right now with no visitors. I probably wouldn't have given that example of the NBC news person if we had a visitor here because it may not be proper under those circumstances because I don't know where they are spiritually, right? And they could be caught up in this whole American sensitivity thing that's ridiculous. So, all things aren't expedient. And Paul says to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, same exact concept. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not ex expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edifieth not. So, we already know what expediency is. And he, so, twice he says, everything's lawful for me, but not everything's expedient for me. But this one he says... All things edify not. So the word edify means to build in a literal sense. To instruct and improve the mind in knowledge generally. And particularly in more and, and religious knowledge. In faith and in holiness. So as a Christian, you should have some goals established in your interaction with people around you. In your interaction with other Christians. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So when two Christians get together and they start talking about spiritual things, both improve on their relationship toward God by that engagement in spiritual things. Iron sharpens iron. And, uh, but we should have this purpose to, to uh, um, bring more knowledge, more religious knowledge, and not religious in the sense of 
just religion in general, but true faith. And more in holiness. We should be trying to help each other become more holy. Now, you got to be careful with that. Because you could step all over somebody's toes. You know, if you get the reputation of being holier than thou, people probably aren't even going to listen to you. So there comes some discernment in this. There comes some being careful about how you approach things. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to walk around on eggshells all the time. And you're going to make some mistakes. I know people that never witness to lost folks because they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing. You can't say the wrong thing witnessing to a lost person. You, you can't. What are you going to do? Send them to a deeper hell? <laughs> they're already going to hell. Amen? Amen? So we need to, we can't build this little wall around ourselves and stay in this little box because we're afraid we'll offend or we're afraid that we'll, uh, that we'll uh, cause harm. We're called to be the voice for God. We're supposed to talk to other folks. We're supposed to talk to fellow Christians. So uh, look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. This is what I was talking about before. Verse 7, it says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of an idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if a man see that see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. You have a responsibility in this liberty. You need to look at those around you, and you need to make choices that are appropriate, that are prudent, that are expedient for the building up of holiness. And so you don't have this, well, the preacher said, if it's right, I can do it, and I think that fill in the blank. I think that going to a bar and drinking myself drunk is right. Amen. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> I think that going to an X-rated movie is right. Now listen, that's where a lot of religious faiths have fallen on their face. Because you have, in the 70s, the Baptist movement went through this phase where you can't dance can't go to any dances. Well, where is that in the Bible? David danced before the Lord. Now, I get it. If you're going and you're dancing dirty, dancing all that stuff, that's not right. But you can't set up a rule that says nobody can go dance. They said you can't go to any movies. Well, you know what? What Hollywood's putting out these days, it would be very few movies that it would be expedient for you to go to. But guess what? You have liberty, and if you're if you have no conscience about going to a dance and no conscience about going to a movie, first of all, you need to check your conscience because there's some movies you ought not to go to. And there's some dances you ought not to go to. But you also got to take this other thing into consideration. I'm going to a dance and it's a very nice dance and we're going to be apart from each other. We're not going to be grinding on each other and all that good stuff. But you know what? Donna lives right by where they're having the dance, and I know that she's against dance, and I, I shouldn't go to that dance because it would offend Donna. And in so offending Donna, I would offend Christ. That's what the scripture that we just read said. But for a preacher to stand up and say, you can't go to dances, you can't hold... In, in uh, Hiles Anderson University, I just talked about Jack Hiles, 
young man and young woman would go to the university. He has a huge university there, Hiles Anderson University. And man and woman would go there. They'd meet, they'd fall in love, they'd be Christians, they'd be of like faith, they'd want to get married. But they had rules that you could never be alone with her ever. You couldn't touch her any way, shape, or form, not even to um, hold her hand crossing the street, for, which is an act of safety more than it is an act of, of uh, emotion or whatever. But they set up all these rules. And if you got caught touching a female, you would be kicked out of their school for, for touching a female, if you were male. If you're a female, you could touch a female. But if you touch a member of the opposite sex, they'd kick you out of school. Now, how is that propagating the love of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, the gospel of Christ? Here are guys going to school to become a preacher. He's being appropriate in his behavior. He's not engaged in, in premarital sex or anything like that. But he's in love with a girl and they're probably going to end up getting married. And he's going to be a preacher and she's going to be a preacher's wife. But he got kicked out of school because he got caught touching her. That's not, a, that's not biblical. And that's what causes people to get turned off by the Christian religion. All these traditions of men that make the word of God of none effect. Now... <clears throat> I realize in this text that we just read that the context is eating Zeus burgers. But it applies to any and every element of life beyond just eating meats offered to idols. The principle being taught crosses the boundaries. There's some things that I could do that I have the liberty to do, but it might offend Ed. Then I ought not to do it. And you say, well, you mean you ought not to do it in front of Ed? No, I probably ought not to do it. Because, especially in a church, folks run in circles, right? And as this church gets bigger, I, I've heard people say, I hate the uh, politics of a church. Well, it's kind of too bad because as a church gets bigger, there's going to be certain circles and certain little groups that form. It just happens because folks find folks that they like and other folks find folks that they like and it just happens but there's talk that happens within those groups and I have this liberty that I want to do something and it doesn't bother me a bit but it's offensive to Ed and if I go and do it just because Ed's not around Brian's going to hear about it and eventually it's going to get back to Ed you know the preacher did this so if I know if it's offensive to somebody my liberty just went out the window because I got to be true unto God. Amen? Amen? And if I offend a brother, the Bible clearly teaches that I'm offending Christ. Is all this coming together? Does this make sense to y'all? So, beyond that, who in here has lost folks that you get around once in a while? Whether by work or whatever, family, whatever. So, <clears throat> You know what those lost people are doing? They're looking for you to fall in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. They want you to fall. Because then they can wash their hands of everything that you've told them and say, they're no better than me. Yeah. They're watching. They're looking for the mistake. They're looking for the thing that, that, that tradition has taught you can't do. You know... The, one of the big things in the Bible is drinking. Is, is, and that was the first question I was asked as your pastor. Pastor, are you against drinking, having a beer, or having a glass of wine? Or, and I said, you know what, if it's right, do it. <laughs> if it's wrong, quit it. And if you can't quit it, beat yourself up. You know what the b verses in the Bible say about drinking? They don't say, don't drink. They say, don't drink to excess. Don't get drunk. And uh, Baptist preachers like to grab that verse that says, Woe unto him that serveth his neighbor strong drink. That's as far as they take the verse. Amen. <laughs> but there's right. more to the verse than woe unto him that serveth his neighbor strong drink. That's right. The verse says, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the verse memorized, Woe unto him that serveth his neighbor strong drink with the intent of getting them naked. <laughs> That's the rest of the verse. And you know what happens all the time in the lost world. 
people try and get their girlfriend drunk so that they can get her naked. That's why it's in the Bible, brother. That's why it's in the book. They're looking for you to slip. What your conscience knows about you, though, is more important than what your neighbor knows about you. There's nobody sitting in this room, present company included, that hasn't violated their conscience. And you ought not to violate your conscience. It's a, the Bible says that the more you violate your conscience, the weaker your conscience will get. And that conscience was put there by God to let you know when you're doing wrong. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. How do I know if it's wrong? Your conscience is telling you that it's wrong. Some of you have lied about certain things in your life for so long that your conscience doesn't seem to have much of an impact with you anymore. So I got this little thing that you can do that would tell you whether it violates your conscience or not. If you get around a brother or a sister and they see you do it and you feel too compelled to explain why you do it, your conscience has probably bothered you about it because... Why do you have to justify what you're doing? And so if you're justifying what you're doing before men, you're not going to justify it before God. You're, you're not going to justify it before God. And you're going to stand before God even as a Christian someday. Not to see whether you go to heaven or hell. If you're a Christian, you're going to heaven. But you're still going to stand before God someday and give an account for the things that you do in your life. Here's another good test. Now, this one's a little bit, I've heard preachers say this before, and I think it's kind of weak because they say, if the Lord Jesus Christ was right there with you, would you be doing it? Yeah. Well, that's kind of weak because you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ is right with us. We're Christians, and the Lord is with us everywhere, every minute of every day. And so you're already doing it in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's a, here to me is a better way to look at it. If the Lord Jesus Christ was right there, would he join you in it? If, he, if you say, well, I don't think he'd, you know. There's times when, when Lisa and I sit down with the television set thinking we want to watch a program, and five minutes in, I shut it down saying, I, I can't have that come into my house. I thought this was going to be a good show, but I can't have this coming into my house. We were watching a show the other day, and, and uh, it was uh, like one of them superhero things. I don't know what they call those, where it's an action film with, with superheroes and stuff. And they started praying to some god. Well, the thing went off right then and there. I'm not going to have some false god being prayed to even through a TV set coming into my home. And I'm glad that God gives me a conscience over that. But you know what? There's some Christians that would sit down there and say, that's oh, just a movie. It doesn't mean anything. Really? Would you get down on your knees and join that character in prayer to that God? Would the Lord take pleasure in you with that prayer to that false God going up in your house? We need to be more sensitive. Listen, we've gotten callous. We need to be more sensitive to that stuff. Our liberty comes with expeditiousness. <laughs> We're supposed to be expeditious in exercising our liberty. We're supposed to be focused on growing in the Lord, growing in holiness, growing in righteousness, not growing in the world. Because really, every, every choice you make is either going to bring you closer to God or bring you closer. There's no neutral ground. You're either going to be closer to the world or you're going to be closer to God, period. You know what happens when you defile your conscience? And like I said, we've all done it. We've all done it. There's times when I ought not to be doing this, but boy, I like it. Whatever that it is. And that it could be different for every single person in the room. But boy, I like it. Sin has its pleasure. That's why people sin. Sin has its pleasure. But here's what a... a when you violate your conscience, here's what happens. A defiled conscience hinders, hinders your service to God. You get that example from Adam and Eve. They did what they knew was wrong, and what did they did, do? 
They sowed feed leaves, covered themselves up, and they hid from God. Well, you're not serving God if you're hiding from Him. It hinders your service to God. It hinders your ability to witness. You don't feel clean. You don't feel like... It just hinders your ability to witness. It hinders your prayer life. Have you ever prayed and felt like your prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling and coming right back to you and they weren't getting anywhere? I have. Violating your conscience hinders your prayer life. You think to yourself, why would God even want to listen to me? I mean, I know, because you know what? That pleasure in sin is very brief. And so you have your little fun with sin, whatever your sin may be, and then it's gone, it's done. And now you have remorse over the fact that you didn't have more character and stand up against that sin. It hinders your prayer life. It hinders your giving. It hinders your relationship with others. You know what? I, I, when I was going to Bible school, there was a point in Bible school where I got very backslidden. And uh, I didn't want to be around the other students. I mean, I was putting on a pretty good show and all. At least I thought I was. I wasn't because they picked up on the fact that I wasn't hanging around them like I used to hang around them. One night I went to bed. And I'm laying down, about ready to go to sleep. But it was a summer night and the windows were open. And I started getting serenaded from outside my window. It was three Bible students that were outside my window singing, Arise, My Soul, Arise. You know that song? Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands before the throne. There's a verse in there that says, nor let that ransom sinner die. These guys saying, now let that ransom sinner die. And I'm like, wait a second, guys. <laughs> Don't let this ransom sinner die. That's not a good way to come to your friend. But it was a wake-up call for me. It impacts your fellowship with other Christians when you violate your conscience. There's no way around it. It does. It places you in the most serious of all threats before the holy God you profess to believe in. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron that's what happens when you continually violate your conscience you get seared with a hot iron now, this is talking about safe folks departing from the truth. You say, I've heard people say over and over again, I don't know how a real Christian could do blah, blah, whatever that person that you're talking about is doing. Well, I know how they can do it. They violate their conscience over and over and over, and it gets seared with a hot iron, and they give heed to seducing spirits. That's what this text says. It's what the Bible says about it. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just back a couple of books. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 14. It says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's part of your responsibility with the liberty that you have. 
Abstain from all appearance of evil. Live right. Lester Roloff, great uh, preacher from Texas, died years and years ago, probably back in the 80s. He died in a plane crash. But he used to say, do right till the stars fall down. Do right. Do right. With your liberty, choose to do right. Amen? There's a whole list of things right there that you can do within your liberty that God wants you to do. Right there in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 14 through 22. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I exhort you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice, and being a living sacrifice isn't anything special. That's just your reasonable service based on what Christ has done for you. But I like what I do. I like my little pleasure moments. Get over it. Get some character. God wants you to have character. God's more concerned with your character, believe it or not, and, and, and I think that this can be proven biblical, than he is with his plan. His plan is going to come to pass. But look at Moses. 40 years old before he makes his first move and he blew it because he got in front of God. Then he went and he hid for another 40 years before God brought him back to Egypt. 80 years old. God said, I'm going to take you out there for 40 years. 40 in your Bible is a number of testing. I'm going to take you out for 40 years and I'm going to work on your character. Because your character is important to me. I don't want you getting in front of me. I want you to have character. Good, strong, Christian character. Give up your little moments of pleasurable sin. Look at 1 Peter um, chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 uh, verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now conversation isn't talking. We, we've perverted the, the term conversation over the years. Conversation is your very way of life the way you live, the way you act, the things that come out of your mouth prove your conversation. Does that make sense? So, uh, where was I? Um, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. God said, you know what? I'm holy. Be ye holy. The Bible says, come out from among them. Amen? We're not supposed to be like the world anymore. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Through this book. Constantly reading this book. You ever think of prayers like when David says, Lord, try my heart. Show me any wicked way that, be, that, that lies within me. Those were sincere prayers by King David. Do you ever pray that? Because you know what? You're, you, over the course of your life, you've probably seared some things with a hot iron that ought not to be part of your life. Lord, show me what wicked ways lie within me so I can work on them and fix them. And then give me the strength, the power, the conviction to follow through. But you know what? A test is always that, a test. God's never going to just take that temptation completely away from you. First of all, he's not the one putting it in your path. There's a split hoof that's putting it in your path. That no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't tempt you. But Satan does. And God allows him to. Because it proves you. And God wants you to be proved. For yourself. For him. For the kingdom. So, work on getting some character. 
got this little, I'm not much on poems, but I like some poems. I got this one little poem called Our Can'ts and Our Cans. It says, if you'd have some worse world plans, you got to watch your can'ts and cans. You can't aim low and then rise high. You can't succeed if you don't try. You can't go wrong and come out right. You can't love sin and walk in light. You can't throw time and means away and live sublime from day to day. It's a little poem, but it's powerful. We need to keep track of our cans in our cans. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Does that mean you can get drunk through Christ, which strengtheneth you? Because that doesn't strengthen you. It weakens you. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. What's expedient? What builds on holiness and righteousness? That's where you need to be. That's where the high ground is. That's where your liberty comes into play. Your liberty's not a license to live as dirty and as filthy as you want to live and say, hey, I'm born again. It doesn't matter. It's all under the blood. It's all forgiven. Hmm. So what do we do? We walk. We walk. We walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4. We walk honestly, Romans 13, 13. We walk in the spirit, Galatians 5, 16. We walk worthy of the vocation, Ephesians 4, 1. We walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2. We walk as the children of light, Ephesians 5, 8. We walk circumspectly, Ephesians 5, 15. We walk worthy of the Lord, Colossians 1.10. We walk in wisdom, Colossians 4.5. We walk worthy of God, 1 Thessalonians 2.12. We walk pleasing to God, 1 Thessalonians 4.1. We walk as the Lord Jesus Christ walked, 1 John 2.6. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord, the, the things that were said here, Lord, are easy things to say, but they're hard things to live. And I do pray for the character of each and every person that's sitting in here today that's heard this message. God, I pray that if, if we've seared our conscience, that you would heal it and unsear it. God, I pray that you would search our hearts and find any wicked ways that are within us, Lord, and that you would uh, identify them to us and help us clean them, Lord, and get rid of them. Lord, I pray that we would walk worthy of the vocation. I pray that we would walk as you walked. God, I love these people, and I love your sheep, Lord. And I pray for them, Lord, that you would uh, guide them and direct them, Lord, and help them to do right. The stakes are the highest they've ever been. This world is dying and heading to hell, Lord, and even your children are forsaking the assembling of themselves together. They're doing their own thing, going their own way. They don't believe there's any hope, but yet, Lord, you're still there, and you're still the hope of this world. God, I pray that we go forth and be examples and witnesses I pray, Lord, that somehow you'd reach some of those folks that should be in church that aren't going, Lord, and bring them. Help them to be encouraged in your word. I pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.